Good morning, everyone. We are really grateful that you joined us today. We hope that you're blessed by the worship today. And let's just um, think on these songs and just think about uh, how we can respond to these songs as we sing them to really connect with our Father. Uh, so if you have a Bible near you, if you then be willing to open it up during worship. Uh, let's just be open to what God might speak to us. Um, and we also, if you don't have a Bible near you, I would encourage you to find one uh, or have your phone ready so you can open up your Bible app. Um, but the Lord, He really does work during worship. So when we worship uh, and we call on Him to move and we proclaim His name, you know, the heavenly realms move. And uh, we just, you know, God wants to do things. And so we just want to be willing uh, for to receive what God wants to do. So uh, let's just unburden ourselves, unload the distractions and things um, from our hands, from our minds, uh, from the stuff going on after this or before it. Uh, the things that are uh, distracting us from wanting to turn it off, just tune in for a little bit and leave. We don't want that to happen either. Uh, but right now we really truly believe that God wants um, to use this time to do something special. So let's just tune in to the Lord with focus. Um, so Father, thank you. Thank you for these songs. We want to sing them with joy. We want to proclaim your name. God, we're grateful for, for the victory you have. And Father, for your gift of inviting us into what you're doing with Father. In your name, amen. Down and worship him now. How 
Thank you, Lord.
my the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Through the sun sets free. Oh, his free indeed. I'm a child. Back to the 
you pursue us and you pursue us with the message that you're going to bring us father because we know that um it's blessed by you father and we know that um, the word that we read is true and it's god breathed and that we can uh, listen to it, apply it to our lives and that blessings will come um, the blessings in our lives that will bring us closer to you it may not be blessings that uh we hope or want for ourselves selfishly or, or comfort or things that give us comfort things that give us um, worldly um, gratification, but it's things that will give us spiritual gratification. And Father, that's what we want. Father, we want to be humbled and we want to be on our knees um, saying, Father, you know what we need more than we do, better than we do, Father. And so we just want to say, you know, we're here, Father. We're here with our hands open to you, our hearts open to you, Father, and uh, with a desire to be filled and you meet with us every Sunday, Father. And you meet with us every time we go into our quiet place to read your word and to, and to call on you and to intercede for your people, Father. But we also want to be reshaped. Lord, we don't want to be in a place where we are comfortable and in our relationship where we just don't want to grow anymore because we're comfortable. We don't want to be challenged anymore. But Father, we don't want to be those kind of people. We want to be the people who walk, walk with you, Father. If you were here now starting a ministry, that we would be the ones to say, here I am. What can I do? I want to be with you. I want to walk with you. I want to have nothing, uh, oh, no worldly possessions. I just want to be committed to walking with you, Father. Thank you, Lord. And, we, and that's what we want, Father. We are a church who are just want to walk with you to walk with our, with our King. 
Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you for making a way for us to be able to walk with you. In your wonderful name, your powerful name, in the name of Jesus, amen. Hi, happy Valentine's Day. We're John and Kelsey Mullen, and we want to welcome you to our sermon series we're doing on the book of Acts. Today we're on chapter 15, and there's a lot of lessons for us today as an international church, so hope you enjoy this sermon today. And if you want to join us later for some games, you can email me for the link, for the Google Meet link. That will be a lot of fun. Uh, before we get into the passage for today and before we pray, I want to quickly say what was discussed last week. So in chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas were in their first missionary journey. So in this chapter, they've just gotten back. It's kind of like we could say the first missionary conference. You know, you get together and you tell all your stories and your testimonies. So they're probably just riding high, just excited about everything God did in their travels and then? then like what happens usually in life when something really amazing happens something really hard and terrible happens right together with it so that's what happens in this chapter it's kind of like a wet blanket is thrown on them and we'll find out in just a minute what that's about but there's a lot of practical lessons for us today in how to deal with conflict so before we get there, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this chapter and how it applies to us as a church, but also us individually. Pray for everyone who is out there watching today. Speak a blessing over them. And Father, I just ask that you'd bless uh, this, this word, this sermon. I pray that um, you would help us to make this relevant and apply it to our lives in our context, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Kelsey, can you start us off by reading Acts chapter 15, 1 through 6? Sure. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. So this first section, I'm not done with this slide, but uh, this first section, Paul and Barnabas are almost like on a campaign because they're traveling through Samaria and Phoenicia. And those were Gentile pagan believers, and um, those Gentiles were super excited about other uh, Gentiles coming to know the Lord in other parts of the world. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and the elders met together to resolve this issue. So the heart of the issue is what must we do to be saved? And in a few verses down, we're going to see Peter answers the question. He says, uh, we're saved only by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that we need to appreciate where these Jewish believers are coming from. They've got 2,000 years of history on all the things to do to make you right in God's sight, to make you clean. And this is in stark contrast with their culture, with their history, and what they've known of religion. And so 
they're having trouble uh, turning the corner and making that shift from the, the old covenant into the new covenant where Jesus has already made them clean. So we know the obvious answer to the question is what must we do to be saved is we need to believe. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And I think one of the things we also need to remember is we also need to keep believing. So Paul says in Acts 20, 21, he says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. So it's not enough just to say, I believe one day, but we have to keep believing until that last day. Yeah, I don't think we can underestimate what a big deal this was for those Jews who, you know, for thousands of years had been trying to please God through all these laws. So if you could imagine as an example, if you wrote a novel and I picked up the novel and read the last chapter and said, oh yeah, I get what this is all about. I understand what this is. And, and you were thinking, no, you don't understand at all. You don't have the whole history. You don't know about each character. And all the, all the work I did writing the whole novel, and you read the last few pages, and you think you get the whole thing. So that's kind of maybe how the Jews were feeling at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, can you continue on in the story with verses 7 through 11? At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit. Now, remember the story with Cornelius that we preached about several weeks ago. Those Cornelius and his house and his friends were, were um, Gentiles, and they all accepted and believed, and, um, and that was Peter. That story was with Peter. So he, that's what he's thinking about when he's saying that. Just as he did for us, he made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentiles with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Now, right here, he uses um, a picture of a yoke. A yoke was put on the necks of the animals in doing labor, and different uh, animals were yoked together. But those yokes um, caused chafing and, and blisters. And so he's using this yoke as a really heavy thing that for all the Jewish Jewish people and the ancestors that they were never able to bear. And what does Jesus say about the yoke? His yoke. His yoke is easy. That's right. His burden is light. So the conclusion is we're saved by faith alone, by grace alone, and by Christ alone. Now, I think to bring this into context, I'd like to talk a little bit about the the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and what's happened with the, the system of laws. We know from uh, Matthew uh, 5.17 that Jesus fulfilled the law. But what does that mean? There's different types of laws. And what that means is Jesus has, has come and he has fulfilled all the ceremonial, all the, the ritual laws that would make us clean, that would make us right with God. Because he's done everything. His sacrifice is, is the last. It's the eternal sacrifice. And there's nothing else that can make us uh, more right with God than what Jesus has done. There's another uh, group of laws that are called civic laws. And those are more of like um, case studies on how to love your neighbor, how to live in community. And 
of course, we're not in an agrarian society with bulls and all these other things we're talking about, but a lot of those lessons we can apply uh, to our day and age. You know, maybe the, the animal has killed someone multiple times, and if he does it again, you're going to be responsible for the death of a person. And so there's liability laws and things like that that would come out of those civic laws. And then there's moral laws or moral regulations. And those laws have, have been fulfilled in the sense that uh, Jesus was without sin. He, was, um, he is our moral standard now. But instead of doing away with that, uh, what he has done is he's come and given us a new standard. And he said, don't just not commit adultery. Uh, don't even have lust in your heart. And he says, don't you know, just not commit murder, but don't even have hate in your heart. So the moral laws have actually increased in the new covenant versus what was in the old covenant. And we'll see that uh, some of the things that come up today will involve uh, moral laws and ceremonial laws. Well, circumcision is one of those requirements, those uh, ceremonial laws that make us right with God, or at least made us right with God. In fact, this in particular was the sign that you were the people of God. And so its importance can not be minimalized. I mean, it was a huge deal. And with any covenant required the shedding of blood. And so this particular uh, law was associated with the, the old covenant and the ratification of the old covenant. Well, Jesus brought a new and better covenant, and he said he ratified it with his blood. So circumcision has been made moot. It's no longer necessary. The new sign that you're the people of God is now baptism. And circumcision is a thing of the past, except for these believing Jews would like to keep it a thing of the future. Well, I mean, Jews today and many other people circumcised today um, but can you just imagine, I mean, it's one thing to circumcise your eight-day-old son, who's never going to remember it. It's another thing to ask every adult convert throughout the whole world um, to get circumcised. I mean, that would have uh, extremely limited the, uh, the appeal of Christianity, and it would have hindered people from accepting the gospel and being incorporated into the church. Am I right? Well, actually, it's worse than that because when they got to Jerusalem, the sect of the Pharisees said they, they think that all the Gentiles not only should be circumcised, but they should also follow all the Jewish laws. And how many Jewish laws were there? At the t Well, Mosaic laws, there was like 632, but they had their oral traditions and that was like another 3,000 things. Yeah. So can you imagine the burden that that would be putting on other people who want to uh, follow Christ, who want to receive that free gift that Christ gave to them? Yeah, there were, there were so many laws. So let's bring this forward into our context. What are some examples where people might think the church is putting unnecessary burdens on people today? Yeah, some examples might be attendance or tithing or how we serve or what we wear or makeup or no makeup, how we baptize, all these things. Well, some of those are just preferential things, and then some of those qualify uh, under uh, different categories. For instance, how we behave. Uh, that ties into moral laws and moral regulations, and so... That isn't an unnecessary burden. In fact, that's what the, the leaders of the church say here, that uh, we should expect people to uh, be moral, to be holy like their God is holy. Uh, other things like tithing, uh, that could be also a moral regulation that you, if you're so selfish and in love with money that you don't want to give back to God what he had asked for, that uh, maybe that's a moral thing. Maybe it's a civic thing because, you know, civic laws are all about loving your neighbor and 
loving one another. And there is no church without tithing. There's no way to support the infrastructure. And same thing with attendance. You know, that could be, you know, part of loving your neighbor is showing up and participating in the family of God. And if you, you know, one of those people who just wants to sit home all the time, I know under COVID we have to sit home, but normally you want to sit home and you don't want to participate. You say, well, I'm just a Christian on my own over here. Uh, There is no healthy Lone Star Christian. There's only people that are part of the family of God. And so uh, some of those things are not unnecessary burdens, but other things like you brought up, how you dress or which version of the Bible you read, you know, those those are unnecessary burdens. Well, you have to remember that in the first scripture slide when it said Paul and Barnabas argued vehemently, I mean, it is good to mention that there are some things that we should stand up for. There's some things that we should be willing to have a conflict over, right? Yeah. Like what? Like in this case, the topic of salvation. If someone is trying to say salvation requires you to do uh, something besides believe and keep believing, well, that's something to argue over. Right. So we're going to talk later about um, how to handle conflict. But first, let's read the next slide. Okay, this is Acts 15, verses 19 through 21. It's the, uh, the part of the story right after James quotes Amos. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in the Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. You know, when I've read this story, I always wondered why... Okay, so this is the ruling, these four things. They they put their foot down and they said these four things. And it was always confusing to me, like, why they chose those four things. Because I kind of get the sexual immorality part, but the other three things seemed so random and so arbitrary. You know, besides sexual immorality, there was um, not eating food sacrificed to idols or eating an animal strangled or consuming blood. So why those three things? Well, in my opinion, and people have different opinions, is the, the leaders of the church were recognizing that these Gentile believers were coming out of pagan cultures. And these pagan cultures, it wasn't just cultures, it was pagan religion. So for example, sexual immorality, a big part of the, the pagan religions involved like sex in the temple and temple prostitutes and mm-hmm. and same thing with the blood or the uh, the meat sacrificed to idols it was just all tied up in this whole uh, paganism thing and at the same time especially these blood things and the you know the meat sacrifice it was really offensive to believing Jews they had that history and that culture that that was really offensive and you know, the idea of the church is bringing these two groups together and they're going to be in intimate relationship. And we see in the scripture that the early church met in homes, they mm-hmm. shared meals together. And you can imagine the conflict and the, how just this would not fit if, you know, one guy is bringing to dinner this meat that was sacrificed to an idol and someone else is bringing this dish of blood, whatever, and these other people at the table are from Jewish background that, you know, people are going to get offended. And this is just not how we love one another. Mm -hmm. So I think what they were trying to do was to bring these two groups together. And they weren't thinking of things that they could make the Gentiles do, but they were thinking about things that would bring these groups together so they could coexist and live in love with one another. So you're saying that a lot of these these four things that were chosen were about reconciling the the community. Um, but I also want to make a point that all three of all four of the things are related to idolatry. And when we talk about mm-hmm. sexuality, 
there is a very close association between um, sexual perversion and immorality and our hearts going towards idolatrous things. And what God really cares about is an intimate relationship with Him, not just reconciling people to be in communion, but I think James making this ruling was also thinking about their hearts and guiding them to lifestyles that didn't uh, distract away from their intimacy with God. And I heard an analogy this week, which I really like about glue. And there's all different kinds of glue. And the substance of glue works best when the particles in the glue are similar to the things you're trying to glue together. And so if you're like trying to stick two metallic things together, the particles in that glue will have these metallic qualities in it. And, you know, if you think about the particles that we have in common with God to, to make this connection and this really tight fit and intimacy with the Lord, what is it? It's intimacy through holiness. And God is a holy God, and that's why the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. Mm. And so when the Holy Spirit comes in us, uh, His holiness is in us, and it attracts the Lord to us and us to the Lord, and this is really important. We don't want to we don't want to do anything or live in our lives in a way that's going to um, damage that intimacy with the Lord. Well, can you think of an example where, uh, like these dietary restrictions, could uh, bring conflict into a community? Yes, I. I remembered when I did a Bible training, and there was a guy, we had a big class, there was like 50, and there was a guy in the group who was very into health and fitness, and he was a vegetarian or a vegan, and he was trying to make um, eating meat like a really spiritual issue, and he would go to each person and say, can you imagine Jesus killing animals and eating those animals he killed, and and, you know, what he was doing, he was very passionate about it, but he was causing division in, in the students, and we were all pretty young and immature. So the leaders had to step in and tell the guy, you know, to stop his campaign, really, because it was causing division. So these things still happen today. Hmm. Well, I imagine if they did step in and brought um, biblical support to their point, they might have looked to 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 23 through 26. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul says to the Corinthians, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So this is his conclusion. You may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So the Lord has died for all sins, and this isn't an issue of sin. This is an issue of loving your brother. Yeah, so that's interesting that here he's saying that you can eat any meat, but before they were saying, you know. So your point is it's about not that it's offensive to God. Correct. It's offensive to your brothers and sisters. Correct. And that can be avoided. And in that day of an age, it was a big problem. And it caused when, conflict. When you're trying to, um, to grow the church and to bring the church together. So this was their uh, solution to a multicultural church. So there's some important lessons we can learn in this story about how to resolve conflict. So we're Absolutely. Gonna, we're going to talk about that next. So what, what would be the, one of the first steps from our story well let's go back to the beginning and we see that there was two jewish believers who came and started a teaching that you couldn't be saved unless you were circumcised now paul and barnabas what what's their reaction they argue they disagree they disagree and uh, i don't think that they were caught off guard on this topic. It already come up before. It already come up before. And so 
maybe the first thing we could think about in terms of conflict is it would be wise to to expect some degree of conflict, whether that's in your family at home, whether it's your workplace, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your church community, there's usually going to be some kind of conflict that comes up. Mm -hmm. And conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just uh, something that can lead to uh, a good compromise, a solution, and it doesn't have to lead to division no. or anger. It can actually foster growth and intimacy and vulner vulnerability as you work through it together. But the first step to resolving a conflict successfully is, first of all, expect conflict because it will come no matter what. Well, it says the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, and they were accompanied by some other believers, and basically they sent delegates to Jerusalem, and oh, what does that tell you about the church? It says they were willing to deal with the conflict. Now, the, the opposite of dealing with the conflict is avoiding it and just running away, and that's what happens a lot. That's what a lot of times people don't know how to deal with conflict. They don't want to deal with conflict, which isn't me included. I do not like dealing with conflict at all. So it's sometimes it's easy, you, you think, just to run away, just to leave. But that's not what they did. They dealt with the conflict. It says here that uh, Paul and Barnabas, they disagreed with them and argued vehemently. What do you think that word vehemently means? It means it got messy. Yeah. Yeah. And so tempers were flaring. And so the third point in dealing with conflict is learning how to rein in and control your anger. Sinning, I mean, getting angry is not a sin. It's when you lose control and let your anger control the dialogue that it becomes a sin. That's we right. can do many, many horrible things and say many horrible things in anger. But through Scripture, we're encouraged to control our anger. Now, the interesting thing is, in this story um, that we've read today, they, they did a great example of conflict resolution. But just at the very end of the chapter, we don't have time to talk about it. But they're trying to decide where to go in the second missionary journey. And they strongly disagree about John Mark because he left them on the first journey. And Paul's like, no way. He deserted us. He's not coming with us. And they, they parted ways angrily. So they didn't resolve their conflict correctly. So this is just real life. And it's a great example that, you know, if we either, if we won't deal with the conflict or if we allow our anger to um, get in the way of the conflict resolution, you know, those are examples, things that will prevent us from actually getting to the solutions yep. that we actually want. So we have to be careful about both of those two things. Yeah, so, so, so Paul ends up going to one place with Silas, and Barnabas goes someplace different with John Mark in the end. So let's keep going. So they get to Jerusalem, and it says that they are members of the sect of the Pharisees who are expressing not only that they think the Gentile believers should be circumcised, but they should have to follow the Jewish laws. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, we see in this story that they were willing to listen to the other side, and that's a really important step for conflict resolution. And it's not listening like you're just quiet and you're waiting for them to stop talking so you can push your agenda forward, your opinion, your, your point, but it's listening with a heart that truly cares and truly loves the other side and wants to know where they're coming from. And that can be very difficult when tempers are flaring and when you feel so passionate about something. But they, they listen to the other side. And who, who did they bring the conflict to? Well, they, they brought the 
the conflict to Jerusalem, to the council, to the apostles, but it was the half-brother of Jesus, James, who's also called James the Wise, who was leading the church at this time. It wasn't Peter, as, you know, uh, like Catholic tradition, but at this time it was clearly James, and he was the wise counsel. So that's the next point. Okay, that we should be uh, listen to wise counsel when dealing with conflict. And sometimes we think we can handle matters on our own. And here's an example that uh, sometimes and often it's a, it's a blessing. Like if you're under authority, uh, you have the blessing that you can trust that authority to bring your problems to, to help you work through conflict. Certainly there are times when, when there, you've come to an impasse and one side and the other side simply cannot see a way forward. That's when you have to seek wise counsel. And that's what they did. And uh, James sought counsel. Yeah, who did James seek, seek counsel with? James uh, knew the scripture as a man of wisdom. He quotes the Old Testament prophet Amos. That's right. So he knew his scripture, and that's another important point. To look to the Bible for anything it might have to say uh, regarding your specific conflict. Now, your specific conflict may not be in the Bible, but it might be something related. But we, we need to uh, use the Bible as a resource, and not just any resource, but uh, the Bible's the final word. And so we need to uh, look to the Bible for answers in our conflicts. And the last step is uh, tricky because of the word we're going to use, but the last step is necessary really in every conflict. So the end of the story is James picks out these four points that the Gentile believers are going to be asked to do. That He's putting these only these four burdens upon them, and that is not anything that the Gentile, well, Let's just say they would rather have zero burdens. But um, James said, no, these are four things that are not negotiable. And those four things were not enough for the Jewish believers. So in the end, what you have is a compromise. And that's what James could see. For, um, for the sake of the, the greater cause and the bigger picture, James said, okay, these four things and it it required compromise on on both sides and that's the way it is with any relationship you can't expect to always get your way you can't expect to always be right and you don't always get your way I don't always get my way and sometimes uh, it's painful but for the sake of the bigger picture and the greater good we have to compromise but not on the essentials but on most everything else and so we're going to wrap it up for sake of time. And I just want to close with a passage from 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. He says, finally, I want all of you to live together in peace. Be understanding. Love one another like members of the same family. Be kind and tender. Don't be proud. Don't pay back evil with evil. Don't pay back unkind words with unkind words. Instead, pay them back with kind words. That's what you've been chosen to do. You can receive a blessing by doing it. And so this whole story today is really about how to love one another. And <clears throat> it says you're of the same family and we need to keep that in mind as we go through conflicts uh, in our lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our workplaces. We need to keep uh, love as the forefront of how we're going to work through those conflicts. Yeah, and at, at PCF, we're so diverse. We're from so many different places and backgrounds and church backgrounds. And uh, I, love, I just love how love covers it all. We used, always have a saying, church can't be here like it was back home because back home for all of us looks differently. So mm -hmm. we live in the world of compromise, but... Our multicultural world is actually a taste of heaven. Heaven's going to be multicultural as well.
And it's how we demonstrate to the world the love of God when we love each other and we're so different. I want to read, especially in honor of Valentine's Day, some of 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to read it slowly. And as I read it, I just like people to think if you have some unforgiveness, if you have some unresolved conflict in your life, and you can meditate on the, the steps that we talked about in this story. And it's incredible how the kingdom of God was able to expand in that time because of James, because mm. of that compromise and, and his wisdom. And so let, a, let love cover all of our relationships. So uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It always is hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for Valentine's Day for just the um, reminder that, that you love us first and foremost, that we're loved by the one who matters most. Thank you, Lord, for uh, this lesson today about a conflict and about salvation and um, how to live our lives. And Lord, we, we ask that you would give us the grace to uh, live our lives uh, marked by love, especially love for one another as we are the same family in the body of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would just pour your spirit out on us afresh today. We confess that we need you and uh, we also need one another. So I pray, Lord, that you would um, just provide ways for us to connect and be together in the midst of this lockdown. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Speaking of connecting, why don't you tell us about today, this afternoon, the games? So look for my email below. And at 2 o'clock Prague time, we will gather for some online games. So see you there. We also have intercession on Saturday and Sunday mornings. And if you want information on that, you can write us as well. God bless you and have a great week. Bye.